At what moment in prehistory did man, with a capital M, scratch her or his head and look up at the sky and ask, what is the governing principle at work in the universe? And then, rather later, what the heck am I doing here? Well, we can't be sure that man wasn't asking the first question in the Neolithic period. But what we do know is that he or she was certainly asking that question by the end of the 6th century BCE. The first philosopher of whom we have record, Thales of Miletus, declared that it all came down to water in the end. Water, he observed, is the arche, the, the principle, the origin of all things. Then along came Anaximander, who claimed that air was the origin of all things. And then along came Anaximenes, who claimed that something called nous, roughly intelligence, is the origin of all things. Each of these philosophers was trying to find answers without bringing the gods into the equation. Probably, if we'd been able to interview them, they would have said, the gods don't explain anything because they are part of the created world, not outside it. They're actually a human artifact. No one understood this better than Xenophanes of Colophon. If you asked a cow or a horse or a lion to draw a picture of his god, he wrote, each would make a shape similar to their bodies. Protagoras struck the same admirably skeptical note. About the gods, I am unable to say whether they exist or not, nor what they are like. Many circumstances make it impossible to know. There is the obscurity of the subject, and there is the brevity of human life. I wish the chief rabbi and the ayatollah and the pope and the archbishop of Canterbury had the courage and the humility to say something along these lines. One early philosopher who incorporated religion into his system was Pythagoras, about whom nothing can be said that isn't disputed. Pythagoras, in quotes, might be the name of a group of thinkers belonging to a single school. We know him as the inventor of Pythagoras's theorem. He or they taught that the order or harmonia of the universe was written in numbers, a very modern idea. He or they taught the doctrine of metempsychosis, the belief that souls are constantly being recycled so to speak, inhabiting one body after another. There's an amusing anecdote that Pythagoras once stopped someone from beating a dog because he recognized him by his bark. He must have been a very irascible fellow. Members of the Pythagorean sect led a kind of existence that anticipated monasticism to some degree. They were vegetarians, so they didn't participate in the rite of sacrifice, and that marginalized them from the life of the city-state. The first period of Greek philosophy is known as pre-Socratic. That's because of the immense influence of Socrates. Pre-Socratic philosophy was interested solely in the material world and not in human beings, which was what Socrates was interested in. Socrates was not, however, the first philosopher to concern himself with human behavior. There was a group of philosophers with whom he was contemporary, who also concerned themselves with human beings. These were known as sophists. A sophist has come to be a pejorative term, as in sophistic, meaning a clever answer that bends the truth. And it is largely due to Socrates and his pupil Plato that the word took on that meaning. The sophists were relativists, whereas Socrates was an idealist. I'll talk more about this distinction in a moment. Socrates, like Jesus, never wrote anything down. Practically everything we know about him derives from his pupil Plato, who was a voluminous writer and who founded a philosophical school called the Academy because it was located in a grove that was sacred to a revered hero called 
academos. That's how the word academy entered into our language. It has been aptly said that if it weren't for Plato, Socrates would be just a footnote to philosophy. Plato wrote 25 dialogues and a work called The Apology, and Socrates is the principal speaker in most of them. Plato also wrote 13 letters, though their genuineness is disputed. There's no doubt that there's something rather comical about philosophers. There's an amusing anecdote about Thales of Miletus that Plato tells us, that the great man fell into a well while gazing up at the stars. But the place where philosophers get really torn apart is in Aristophanes' comic masterpiece, Clouds. The central character is Socrates, who runs a frontisterion, a thinking shop, a sort of university which charges fees and indulges in a lot of nonsense, like measuring how far a flea can jump. The chorus, which comprises actors dressed up as clouds, symbolise the fact that it's all airy-fairy nonsense with no practical application whatsoever. Because Socrates never wrote anything down, it's nigh impossible to know what was his philosophy and what was the fruit of Plato's reflections. Plato lived a very long life and his ideas changed over time and no doubt his earlier dialogues represent Socrates best. But I, I'm not going to wrestle with that conundrum here. I'll concentrate upon what we can say with some certainty about the historical Socrates. First, he taught using the dialectic method, the method of question and answer. Say you're discussing justice, a central topic in the Republic, incidentally the most widely read philosophical work today. Socrates would ask you for your definition of justice and you'd come up with a half-baked definition. He'd say, oh, what a splendid definition. Let me just ask you one or two questions to make sure I understand what you mean. And then he'd proceed to rip you to threads and prove your definition was half-baked. Socrates' goal was to shatter the conceit of false knowledge. And often he seems content simply to do that, rather than put forward any definition of his own. Pedagogically speaking, it's not a technique likely to endear you to your students. And it's for that reason Socrates acquired a reputation for irony. It's partly why he fell afoul of the Athenian citizen body. He'd majorly pissed off a lot of Athenians by this irritating technique, which made his interlocutors look like fools. Secondly, he despised democracy. The fact that Socrates associated with aristocrats makes this clear. But in addition, Plato put some very dismissive remarks into his mouth, which may well be authentic. In Republic, he says, democracy, in my view, comes about when the poor are successful and kill the rich, exile others, and give everyone else an equal share in political activity and offices, and where the public offices are filled by lot. And again, no one would be prepared to employ a pilot or carpenter or flautist chosen by lot. But when you want anyone to run your city, you go to any common amateur to do the job. Thirdly, he refused to participate in religious observance and claimed he had access to a private deity. He called it his daimonion, his little demon, though this was actually a good demon which kept him from doing bad things. Having a personal deity was a no-no in Athens, however. It's one of the reasons why the Athenians executed him. And one last thing that I strongly believe to be original to Socrates is the conviction that virtue is based on knowledge. Socrates' rejection of the relativism of the sophists led Plato down the path of idealistic philosophy, the belief that justice and virtue and courage, etc., aren't relative values, but absolute values. 
I'll illustrate this by reference to the symposium, his great dialogue of middle years. The dialogue takes its name from its setting, a drinking party. I'll be talking about the institution in detail in lecture 23. On the occasion recorded by Plato, the decision is taken that each of the guests should deliver a speech on love. And so they do, each speaker modifying the speech of his predecessor until it's Socrates' turn to speak. Socrates comes up with this wonderful definition. Love is the desire for the perpetual possession of the good. Love, he further says, is the child of poverty, his mother, and contrivance, his father. Poverty impregnated contrivance with love while he was asleep. And that's why love is always needy because of his mother and always skilled at gaining his desire because of his father. And then Socrates goes on to deliver a masterly explanation of what is often called the theory of forms, the philosophy of idealism, the theory that we live in a world of shadows that is a pale imitation of truth. The speech that Socrates delivers is attributed to an otherwise unknown person called Diotima, a woman from Mantineer. Socrates says that there are two kinds of immortality, one due to reproduction in the body and the other due to reproduction in the mind. In other words, through ideas that are transmitted from teacher to pupil. I like what Woody Allen said, though I don't know whether he read Plato. I don't want immortality through my art. I want it by not dying. The trajectory of Greek philosophy demonstrates a strong line of intellectual descent from teacher to pupil, most evident in the relationship between Socrates, who taught Plato, and Plato, who taught Aristotle. I think we learn a lot about teaching from Plato's symposium, somewhat troubling though it is from a modern perspective. The dialogue advances the contentious theory that teaching is most effective when love, or at least some approximation thereof, exists between mentor and student. Even though, and th this is very important, the dialogue is dismissive of that love resulting in a physical relationship. You don't have to agree with everything Plato writes. I don't believe he would want you to, but the symposium provides a highly instructive starting point for a discussion about what makes a successful teacher, about asymmetrical relationships, and much more besides. I think we hear the authentic voice of Socrates in the statement, all that I know is that I don't know, to which the Pyrrhonian skeptics of the third century see added, and I'm not even sure about that. Plato, and I suspect Socrates, wasn't exclusively or even primarily committed to finding true knowledge, episteme, uh, from which we get the word epistemology. What he was indisputably committed to was uprooting false opinion, the word doxa in Greek. They saw nothing wrong with a dialogue ending in aporia, which means being in a state of perplexity or puzzlement. In Plato's early dialogue, the Mino, Socrates gives a geometry lesson to a slave. Uh, many of these dialogues, by the way, are named after the principal interlocutor. He asks the slave, what is the length of the side of a square? And the slave thinks he knows the answer, but he gets it wrong. And Socrates says, now he knows he doesn't know and is properly perplexed. Perplexed. The word is aporitikos in Greek. And then Socrates continues as follows. So in perplexing him and numbing him like a stingray, have we done him any harm? And Mino replies, no, I don't think so. And then Socrates says, in fact, we have helped him because we have made him aware of his ignorance. 
so the numbing process was good for him. And Mino says, I agree. So being confused and uncertain is better than being certain and wrong. Plato is an ambiguous figure. He is a prose writer of great refinement, and in dialogues like Symposium and Republic, he provides us with unique insight into the world of late 5th, early 4th century Athens and its cast of characters, thanks to the descriptive power of his writing. But he is also a somewhat frightening personality. That's because in what is often called his middle period and more so in his later period, he becomes repressive and censorious. The ideal state that he envisages in Republic is a totalitarian institution, one in which the individual exists for the good of society as a whole. No one put this more forcefully than Karl Popper in The Open Society and Its Enemies, published in 1945, just at the end of World War II, in which Popper acknowledges Plato's greatness as a sociologist, but exposes what he sees as his attack on liberal democracy and the open society. Plato's hatred of democracy, Popper says, led him to, I quote, defend lying, the suppression of truth, and ultimately brutal violence. Plato is admittedly seductive. A Popper entitled the first volume of the open society and its enemies, The Spell of Plato. But is he a totalitarian? It's a great question. I, I wish we had time to debate it. Plato's greatest pupil was Aristotle. He studied at the academy for 20 years. Pupil he may have been, but his own man he became, departing radically from the teachings of his mentor. Plato is a friend, but truth is a truer friend, he is said to have remarked. He was born in Macedon, spent a stint in Athens, returned to Macedon where he became tutor of Alexander the Great, and then in 335 he returned to Athens where he founded his own philosophical school, the Lyceum. Most of what we have of Aristotle's writings appear to be edited lectures. Aristotle has influenced pretty well every branch of intellectual inquiry. Not only did he lay the foundations for two sciences, biology and logic, but he also invented a theoretical vocabulary for conducting scientific research. Words like species and genus, subject and predicate, necessity and contingency, potentiality and actuality, all owe their genesis to Aristotle. His energy was prodigious, his curiosity encyclopedic, and we have only some of the works he wrote down, many are lost. He got certain things wrong. He believed that slavery was, quote, natural, and that women's bodies were inferior to men's, but that shouldn't be held against him. He was a product of his time and couldn't always think outside the box. But he expanded the dimensions of the box exponentially. The Finnish scholar Tanel Kukkonen sums it up well. If one were ex hypothesi to imagine surgically removing the Aristotelian strand from the history of Western philosophy or science or theology, it is difficult even to imagine what the end result would look like. Aristotle's influence wasn't confined to the West. His impact on Islamic high culture was enormous as well, and it remains so to this day in educated circles in Iran. One of the reasons why I'm a fan of Aristotle is because he identified happiness as the supreme good of human life. In fact, he spent more time discussing happiness than any philosopher before modern times. He was also very concerned about teleology, the end in itself or purpose of an activity. In the Nicomachean Ethics, he argues that human beings seek things like honor and pleasure because they hope they will lead to happiness, 
but they don't pursue happiness for any other reason or goal than for happiness itself. The pursuit of happiness. It's a pursuit because it requires activity. And similar to goodness and virtue upon which the attainment of happiness depends, it is, or at least it can be, profound and enduring. There were two major schools of philosophy that evolved around 300 BCE, Epicureanism and Stoicism, both of which were enthusiastically taken up by the Roman elite. Though the founders of each was born abroad, both established their schools in Athens. Stoicism, which was founded by Zeno of Citium, Citium was a city in Cyprus, takes its name from the fact that its pupils hung out, I don't know any better word to express it, in a colonnaded building known as a stoa in the northwest corner of the Athenian Agora. The stoa in question was the stoa poikile, the painted stoa, so identified because of the paintings it housed. Zeno's followers were first known as Zenonians and then later, perhaps somewhat disparagingly, as Stoics. We know very little about Stoicism in the first 300 years of its existence because no philosophical work is extant from that period. A central belief was that virtue, arete, is the highest aim of life. Though Stoicism originally had a cosmological aspect to it, by Roman times it was concerned chiefly with ethics. In fact, it's from Roman writers that we learn most, by far, about Stoicism, specifically from three men. Uh, Seneca, who was the advisor to the Emperor Nero, Epictetus, a former slave, and the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Seneca and Epictetus lived in the first century, and Aurelius in the late second century CE. Epictetus is the only slave or former slave who has left us anything in writing from either Greece or Rome. He came from Phrygia in Turkey on the borders of the Greek-speaking world. I suppose we shouldn't complain that Epictetus turned his hand to philosophy, but I can't help wishing he'd also written just a little bit about his life as a slave although it's possible that his experience as a slave did colour his writings, since he was instrumental in promoting the belief that the enslaved are as human as the free. Virtue, according to Seneca and Epictetus, is to be found in the will, which means that every person has perfect freedom, so long as she or he emancipates themselves from earthly desires. Now, we can readily understand why such a philosophy would appeal to an ex-slave. Although the body might be imprisoned, he noted, the mind is always free. Seneca demonstrated that he had perfect freedom by calmly committing suicide when ordered to do so by Nero, whose advisor he had once been. My favourite Stoic is Marcus Aurelius, often regarded as one of the good emperors, though he did preside over the persecution of the Christians. Marcus wrote a book called To Himself, Ta Eis Heauton, which is usually rendered in English as Meditations. It's one of the first in a long line of self-help books, because the author, although he's addressing himself, gives basic advice about how to live well. Marcus was a pioneer of globalism. I am for my city and my country, insofar as I am Antoninus, but insofar as I am a man, I am for the world, he wrote. Stoicism, more than any other ancient philosophical school or intellectual movement or religion, advocated a principle of natural equality between man and woman, and between master and slave. That said, it did not launch a social revolution to improve the lot of women or to abolish slavery. All the Stoics actually did was to issue a general exhortation to behave equitably to all. The one criticism I would level at them is their seeming coldness, even frigidity. They seem to have believed that although it's all very well to condemn the passions and to seek to rise above them, 
when someone you love is in pain, you should still try to rise above your emotions and achieve the state of being known by the Greek word apathia. Our word apathy, of course, though it didn't carry a pejorative sense for the Stoics as it does for us. The English 20th century philosopher Bertrand Russell summed up Stoic philosophy somewhat disparagingly as follows. The Stoic is not virtuous in order to do good, but does good in order to be virtuous. That said, the Stoics did help to create a world in which Christianity could take root by advocating the virtue of philanthropia, or to use the Latin word humanitas. Though one very important distinction between Stoicism and Christianity is that the Stoics did not believe in the immortality of the soul. The other major philosophical tradition, Epicureanism, is named after its founder, Epicurus, who established a school known as the Garden in Athens. Epicurus's writings are no longer extant, and most of what we know about his philosophy derives from a poem in hexameter verse, the meter used by Homer and Virgil, written by a Roman poet named Lucretius. Epicurean in English means someone who overindulges in sensual pleasure, especially pleasure associated with taste. But that's not what Epicurus advocated at all, far from it. He certainly wasn't a foodie. Uh, he advocated a life of strictly moderate pleasure and avoidance of pain. Lucretius's great poem, De Rerum Natura, on the nature of things or the universe, begins with a very moving invocation to Venus, goddess of love, whom he describes as the guiding power of the universe. But the gods, he indicates, are not concerned with us. Lucretius then pays tribute to Epicurus for having rescued humanity from groveling dependence on what we would call superstition. He cites the horrifying example of Agamemnon sacrificing his daughter Iphigenia to appease Artemis, Diana, in order to gain a favourable wind to convey his fleet to Troy. Epicurus is Lucretius's hero. In his view, he's a monster slayer, except that the monster he's slain is not some many-headed beast of mythology, but the world of our sick imaginings, in particular our fear of death and the world to come. Everything is material according to Epicurean belief. That's because everything is made out of atoms, rerum primordia, the building blocks of the universe which can't be divided. Even the soul, he alleges, is made of atoms, albeit very fine atoms. There's no point worrying about death because death is merely oblivion. So enjoy yourself within limits because to go to excess is to invite pain. We are so lucky that Lucretius is still with us. In the 15th century, only one manuscript survived, mouldering away in a German monastery before Poggio Bracciolini, emissary of the Pope and an inveterate manuscript hunter, came across it. Its discovery is the subject of Stephen Greenblatt's thrilling book, The Swerve, How the World Became Modern, which was winner of the 2012 Pulitzer Prize. It claims that if Lucretius had been lost, the modern age would not have taken shape the way it did. Its title, The Swerve, is a reference to the Epicurean belief that atoms falling through the void swerve slightly, just as Western thought swerved with the rediscovery of Lucretius. Like Galileo, the staunch defender of the Copernican, that's to say heliocentric worldview, Lucretius devoted his intellect and creative energy to defending the theory of a dead man because he believed it was true. It's generally claimed that philosophy remained a lively industry in Athens until 529 when the Byzantine emperor Justinian withdrew funding. 
As so often in history, things aren't quite that simple. Plato's Academy was largely inactive in the first centuries BCE and CE, and even after 529, the tradition of philosophical discourse didn't die out completely. Philosophy isn't a universal human activity. It tends to have located itself in the West, though I'm not going to claim that it's exclusive to the West. So what was the contribution of the Greeks to Western philosophy? Bernard Williams, an English 20th century philosopher, answered that question succinctly. The contribution of the Greeks to Western philosophy was philosophy itself. When I'm teaching Plato to students at 8.30 in the morning, I remind them how privileged we are to be spending time thinking about life and the best way to live it. Not everybody gets that chance. The Greeks, the Athenians in particular, were privileged as well. They had leisure time to devote to thinking, thanks in large part to slavery, but they also had the inclination to do so. You may recall Odysseus' encounter with the lotus eaters, a people who spent their lives high on drugs. Now, this was not the Greek way. I always remember what Socrates said, the unexamined life isn't worth living. That, I believe, is why you and I are engaged in discourse. We have the leisure, but also the inclination to examine the meaning of life and the fact that we do so by attempting to be rigorous and objective owes much to Greek philosophy. It's time to tackle a related subject, science, in which, yet again, the Greeks excelled.